Tom, can we have you come up to the stage? Uh, we're prepared to take any questions. One right off the bat, uh, Stu, since you're up here. Presuming you have a patient that's already taking aspirin, like you said, for cardiovascular causes, and he's on a PPI for prophylaxis, based on aspect, and he asked you, gee, if I have Barrett, should I take high-dose PPIs or low-dose PPIs? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they seem to be safe even on the low-dose PPI, so it did seem to protect, uh, well, we don't know that it protected against anything because there was no placebo group, but we do know that the rate of bleeding was very, very low in patients taking aspirin. So I think if you're using it only for that reason, there's no dose to use, there's no need to use high-dose PPI. So, so quick for Stu, let us assume that the side effects that you're worried about are not real. <laughs> and we won't know that for a very long time. Right. High dose PPI was no more risky than low. So why not take a chance that it's better? Could you support that? Yeah, well, I, I think that is one conclusion you could draw from this study. Uh, my problem with it is that, as I showed you, the, the data are just so non robust. Whether or not the, the PPI side effects are real, uh, the cost is real. <laughs> and so, you know, taking, uh, taking a quadruple dose of, uh, of omeprazole, essentially, versus the one tip pill a day uh, would certainly increase a lot of cost with, I think, very limited uh, data that it's really doing anything very good. And uh, so I'm, I'm not ready to make that change. And it would be interesting to see what the societies do with that information whether societal guidelines will change on that basis. And maybe this society, so that would be interesting. And Tom, real quickly, um, H. pylori is a human model of perhaps acid control, not to the degree of PPIs, I would admit. But the human who is infected has a pH that's probably going to be closer to two to two and a half in many situations. The analogy that H. pylori is protective against the bad effects of GERD is out there. Can you comment on that in terms of your thought process of pH control being a bad thing? Uh, the, U, the PPI in the population of patients we treat here in the U.S. is extremely small. And its effect uh, uh, against cancer of the esophagus has just not been proven to uh, be a problem. So I think uh, it's nice, if you have active disease, you should treat it, but it's very rare to see uh, intestinal metaplasia in the area of the cardiac with, uh, in, in Americans or people in this, uh, in this society that we treat. So that, I, I wouldn't, that doesn't change my attitude towards it. I think it's good to check on it, but uh, the key thing, I'm not against PPIs. I'm against PPIs when you got bile in solution in your stomach. That's where I think PPIs get into trouble because they change the pH to keep the bile in solution and affect the cells of the mucosa and the esophagus. So I'm not an anti-PPI guy, but once you see they're moving in the direction of having intestinal metaplasia microscopically, it's a sign that that combination of that gastric juice is bad and get them off the PPIs and fix the sphincter. That's the way we normally are. You know, all of you that have a good sphincter, don't worry about getting cancer. Not one person here worries about getting cancer who's got a good sphincter. But if you have a bad sphincter and you're refluxing, you worry about it. Fix the sphincter. It's the forgotten part of this disease. Thank you, Tom. Our microphone. Thanks, Ed. Parashah on New York. I loved it, uh, as usual, and, and I'm going to be a little bit provocative uh, in the uh, setting of what the purpose of this society is. So, Stu, you articulated very clearly that acid causes ongoing damage in the setting of underlying GERD and allows for progression to adenocarcinoma. I think, Tom, you've been saying that for years as well. And clearly, PPI use diminishes acid exposure to that uh, at-risk mucosa. So does 
surgery. So does interventions on whether it's the sphincter or the hiatal hernia complex or all of the above. So can we agree at least on one principle, which is that our goal for prog preventing progression to cancer needs to be control of acid exposure to the distal esophagus, and we recognize that there are multiple vehicles which can achieve that, medical therapy, endoscopic therapy, and surgical therapy. Would you both be willing to agree to that? I do, absolutely, I agree with you on that. Great. Yeah, I think that uh, if you're preventing reflux, then you're probably preventing damage, and uh, you, you can do it medically, you can do it surgically. In theory, surgically, interventionally should be better because it prevents bile reflux as well as acid reflux, but the data really don't bear that out. Well, I, I just want to, PPIs don't prevent reflux, they prevent acid. There's, a, there's an important distinction, it's one that I engage with my patients in all the time, is when you've got GERD, you're going to have reflux. What the goal of PPIs is, is to reduce the damaging effect of that reflux. Now, if you also have a regurgitative component, if you have a bile component, then the PPIs aren't going to solve that problem. So I think you, your slide said it perfectly. PPIs reduce reflux esophagitis, and I think that's very clearly been proven. The esophagitis gets better with PPIs, but the reflux itself doesn't. Let me, let me just come back. Again, I want to emphasize I'm not so sure I would say that acid is good for the esophagus, or we should, I, I didn't follow you exactly there, but my, my position is, is if you're trying to get rid of the acid, you're changing the constituency of the gastric juice with the bile, and a mixture that, to me, is very de uh, detrimental to the development of Barrett's, which is the premalignant lesion of carcinoma. So, you know, it's, uh, ideally, you should leave the acid alone. Just leave it the way it is. I think we have physiological reflux after a meal for a purpose, and that is to reacidify to some degree our esophagus. I'm not convinced, just by sort of practical wisdom of looking at nature, every mammal has acid in their stomach. There's a key reason for it. And that, so I wouldn't be so quick to abolish it. The thing to protect is stop it from getting into the, into the esophagus with a good sphincter. Dr. Chandrasoma. Uh, I'm Parachandra Soma, the person who uh, Tom mentioned at the start. And uh, I've worked with Tom for now th 25, 30 years. And what he's done to me is he's put <laughs> me completely out in left field with regard to pathologists, and you can see that the only pathologist who has sought fit to come to this first inaugural meeting is me, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is amazing for a disease supposed to be caused by the squamous epithelium of the esophagus getting exposed to acid. To think that there is no pathology associated with that, and as Dr. Sharma said, you can put pathologists on two sides, and if there are two pathologists, they will disagree on how to diagnose reflux esophagitis. Well, there are three types of pathologists. I'm the third type, again, out in left field, who doesn't believe that the squamous epithelium is of any value in the diagnosis of reflux disease, because the pathologic event, as Dr. Demister said, is the conversion of squamous epithelium to cardiac mucosa. And the reason why I'm in left field is because I'm the only pathologist in the world, may not be in the world now, but in the United States, who believes that cardiac mucosa is not a normal epithelium in the stomach. And as Tom said, the disease will not be addressed unless you figure out the pathology of GERD, which is really the pathology of LES damage. And I think you have to get out into left field as I've converted Tom. You see that the Tom is the only person who's talking about pathology in this entire conference. So we've mutually pushed ourselves into left field and I think that's where you need to get into. Thanks a lot for that comment. David? So um, I always enjoy you guys uh, brains and they've uh, sort of helped my brain evolve over the years. 
Um, we just completed a study that will be <coughs> published in next month's gastrointestinal endoscopy. It looks at intestinal metaplasia, the cardia, in patients with and without Barrett's. And it shows that the patients that have uh, intestinal metaplasia and cardia have an increased incidence of intestinal metaplasia. The patients that have Barrett's have an increased incidence of intestinal metaplasia and cardia. That wouldn't surprise Dr. Demeester at all. Um, and uh, to that point, uh, I think it really is more important that people give it credit for all the current guidelines, at least the most recent 2016 guideline, says you shouldn't worry about the cardio, you shouldn't biopsy it, and then they have this absolutely uh, incomprehensible statement that if Barrett's is only one centimeter, you shouldn't biopsy it, but if it's 1.11111, it's okay to biopsy it. So that never made sense to me biologically. So uh, I wanted to insert that and then follow up on the pathologist conversation. But all of this misses the 95% of patients that develop cancer of the esophagus who aren't in Barrett surveillance programs. And so until we have the quote unquote DNA testing or risk factors for Barrett's and for esophageal cancer, what do you want us to do, Dr. Speckler? What do you want us to do, Dr. Demeester? Not worry about your 5%, that's nothing. What do you want us to do about the real problem, the 95% of people? Stu and Tom? Have the patient return to normal. That's what I want. What does that mean? That means no pills, a good sphincter, and the esophagus free of reflux. How are you going to find those people who are not being studied now? Well, that's up to us. We should start studying these people. When people come in, don't wait until they don't respond before you get a pH and all that kind of stuff. You got a biopsy earlier. You got to know that this is a natural history of Barrett's. It starts very small and it's at a point where it's reversible. And move at that time and get them back to normal. I, I don't have a public uh, public activities uh, information I, about that. I think I mean, you, can, you could continue that debate at a, at a different locale, <laughs> mainly at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stu? Yeah. It's not hard to see why reflux is rampant if you walk through the casino, by the way. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, Dave, you bring up an a, a enormous point here, is that we have a tremendous conundrum that what we've been doing is really not effective, right? Our surveillance policies, whatever they are, are not identifying most of the patients who come to see us with Barrett's esophagus. On the other hand, the whole point of the surveillance is to, I, I'm sorry, the whole point of screening is to enter patients into surveillance that's never been shown to be effective. So, you know, you, you, you're right away faced with that, that conundrum. And then, as you point out, the diagnosis of Barrett's now is limited to patients with one centimeter. You have to have at least one centimeter of lining there. Clearly, we're missing a lot of people with a premalignant lesion down there because of that specific guideline. On the other hand, looking at it from the public health point of view, how much money are you willing to spend on this to prevent the cancer, which is still a relatively uncommon cancer in this country? So we got a lot of difficult issues, and I don't have any simple answers for it. Well, Dr. El Sharad does. <laughs> Asha? Uh, thank you. Great talks. Uh, Stu, I, I, I liked your presentation. I think you presented all the blocks. Um, I thought you were a lot harsher on the data than I expected. I'm going to point out to two things. First, in my mind, the most important question that you are addressing, do PPI prevent cancer in Barrett's, not in the whole wild world? Right. And in my mind, there isn't a single study of the observational studies that examined PPI in Barrett's that did not show reduction in risk. You showed two case control studies that are exactly the opposite. It talks PPI in the whole wild world is not associated with a reduction in, in esophageal adenocarcinoma. So honestly, I didn't need the randomized trial to tell me that there will be a reduction in risk. Now we're going to go to the randomized trial. Finally, it happened 14 years ago. They had a composite endpoint. They reached it. Now we're trying to sort of break it down into pieces. They had reduction in esophageal adenocarcinoma. They didn't achieve the significance because of the sample size. 
But then you have this tons of observational data that shows you exactly the same thing. So in my mind, actually, we can wait for another 20 years to get the evidence or not, but we need to act on the best available evidence today. And the best available evidence today, there is no doubt in my mind that PPI is associated with a reduction risk of, can of cancer in those with documented Barrett's esophagus. And honestly, that's how I practice and tell everyone with me to do the same. Oh, I don't disagree with any of that, Tasha, but let me ask, are you doing double-dose PPI like they did high-dose PPI for all your patients with Barrett's? I do B BID. You do, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an arguable thing. I, I, I agree with you, the data do suggest that PPIs protect against cancer in patients with Barrett's. I'm still uncomfortable with recommending high-dose PPI for everybody. As you know, there are many patients with Barrett. We think of it as horrible reflux disease, which it often is. There's lots of these patients who have no symptoms whatsoever. No, I, I concede on that group. I thought you, what you do is no PPI. At least I'd say have some PPI. I, yeah, okay, yeah, no, as, I agree. And as far as the aspirin, I think there are multiple societies and group of the aspirin advocates that say if you're a man above the age of 55 or so, you have accumulated enough disasters, heart disease, colorectal, et cetera, et cetera, that an aspirin is cost effective, period, whether you have yeah. Barrett's or not. Oh, I agree entirely. And in fact, we tried to do a study on Barrett's patients not on aspirin, and we couldn't do it because they're all on aspirin. And, so, and they're all on aspirin for cardiovascular disease, which I think is great because you definitely are preventing some damage there. But, um, you know, it, it, to take the aspect and, and put it into clinical practice now, I'm still a little uncomfortable. It'll be a lot of debate, and I agree with you on a lot of these. Yeah, points. thank you for making Can Stuart I ask you back a question down. a minute? Can I ask you a question a minute? Uh, and now I'm about I, to I'm, run. I'm going to, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your uh, proposals and what you're doing for the presence of Barrett's. Yeah. Are you interested enough in a patient who is free of Barrett's, as far as you know, and you find intestinal metaplasia on biopsy at the GE junction, are you willing to try to avoid the development of Barrett's for your patient? Uh, I think conceptually, yes. Good. That's all I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> leading the witness. Leading the witness. <laughs> Tom's done his work. I was going to sh shut down the session, but I can't say no to John Panel. Wait a minute. He just cut in front of me over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he did. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just quick question. So, um, you know, esophageal cancer is considered an or orphan cancer. And I think that the question about the 95% of people that we're not detecting who present with advanced local regional disease is the primary problem. And that relates back to our screening. How do we get better funding for esophageal cancer? And how, as a society, do we make that happen? How do we shine the spotlight on it? Thanks. Comment? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the answer is that that's, that's one of those uh, ethereal questions, like, does God exist? John? So uh, I just want to talk a little physiology, since we've kind of ignored the elegant work that Tom did in some of these questions. And once again, I want to congratulate, nobody does these very intricate studies like Tom does, looking at the sphincter and the length. And we've seen that. I mean, certainly you see that pH step up. We looked at that with high resolution manometry, and you see that in the patients with GERD, they extend that pH step up into the sphincter and above. And it was actually Bob Gans who gave me that idea to do that study at that time. The one thing that I haven't heard anybody talk about, especially when we're talking about progression of disease, is obesity. I think obesity wrecks the sphincter. And that's something, too, that I think, you know, when you look at PPIs, all these people are on PPIs, but we're getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And that sphincter is getting stressed and stressed and stressed. And I think that's one of the things we've kind of ignored a little bit. And maybe it's because I didn't show up to the earlier session. You guys might have covered that. But I'd just like your thoughts of where, where do you throw obesity into this mix? Tom, you had an eloquent algorithm there on how to manage uh, your patients with reflux. Did you want to say anything about what you do if it's an obese patient? Well, I, I really, that's a very good question. And I, I, I encourage all of you to read Kenneth McColl's studies in, in Scotland. They're very good. And what happens in obesity, because they are constantly expanding their stomach, there's nobody, you expand your stomach when you eat, and they eat all the time. 
and they expand their stomach and they get the exact same changes I showed you of cardiac mucosa developing in their sphincter. They shorten their sphincter, they get it exposed, and then they start the same process. But the process starts, un there's no symptoms in these patients until later. So eventually, obesity people will connect with the problem of Barrett's. Uh, just very quickly to say that I agree with you entirely on that point, John, and uh, I think obesity is a much better explanation for why adenocarcinoma is increasing than the use of PPIs. All right. Well, Felice has an announcement, so we'll conclude the session with her speech. Congratulations, This Professor. was a, an amazing session. I'm sure none of us wanted to end, but I'm sure many of you want a bio break. So we're going to give a 15-minute break. We're going to cut the break down a little bit just because we went a little bit over. What I'd like to say is that outside, uh, I'm sure all of you want to have apparel that says the American Foregut Society. I know that I do. Um, Saturday night, definitely want to wear that out. So there are polos and t-shirts outside that have our logo. Please feel free to do that. In addition to that, um, ECAN, um, which is the Esophageal Cancer Action Network, an advocacy group that is uh, uh, interested in helping to decrease esophageal cancer and increase awareness, is here. They're interested in doing interviews of people. If you'd like to discuss something related to advocacy because Esophageal Cancer Awareness Month is coming up, and even to talk about this meeting and how perhaps it shaped some of your thoughts about things. Thank you so much.